so much, every, everybody. Um, like Dr. Brian was saying, the Duke Neurology Educators Academy under the direction of Sigma Shaw is really excited to start presenting here a brief uh, series on improving our skills as medical educators. I'm Katie Moore, if I haven't met you before, which I think applies to most of you. I'm a new faculty member in the Movement Disorder Division, so thank you for the opportunity to present to you this morning. I'm excited to kick off our series with a brief presentation on tailoring our teaching to meet the needs, the needs of adult learners. So let's see if this is gonna do for me. Okay, so I, I stole here, um, uh, speaking of our um, neurovascular colleagues, I stole a phrase, time is brain and time is learning. So many of us give traditional lectures, uh, 50 to 60 minutes, but it's been shown that traditional lecture format results in lower learning retention rates and engagement from our learners. Um, and evidence suggests that the typical adult learner attention span starts to wane after 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, for those of you thinking this may have something to do with TikTok, this actually has more to do with how we process new information and form memories than it does social media. So we can't blame Twitter and TikTok for this phenomenon. Short of making your lecture 15 minutes, 20 minutes in length, there are a number of strategies that one can employ to accommodate this attention span and increase learner retention, which of course, um, as the music man was saying, is, is our goal, right? So these things can include everything from, you know, totally rewriting your educational approach, doing small group learning, flip classroom, whole host of other things. But we want to try to make this easy for you and something you can implement right away. So we're going to talk about four easy techniques that you can try. Um, so uh, what we're going to do in the next couple of minutes here is discuss some easy ways for you to address this attention span conundrum without having to totally redevelop your lecture or attention span, uh, sorry, <laughs> lecture or educational plan. The basic idea is that every 15 or 20 minutes or so, you take a quick break with one of these strategies. All the strategies we're gonna to cover today require no additional resources, fairly minimal preparation, and can be used in a didactic group of any size. Of course, there are many other techniques, but today we wanna to highlight ones that are easy to use and things that you can start incorporating even today if you have a lecture planned for today. So let's talk about sort of the most basic one, which is essentially a pause procedure. It's what it's called in the literature. This is basically defined as a brief pause to allow learners to clarify and assimilate information, the most basic thing you can do. So you could simply just pause to ask for questions, show a humorous slide, take a sip of your coffee. The next two strategies that are listed here, the one minute paper and the muddiest point are specific types of these pause procedures. If you learn nothing from this little presentation, just know it's a great idea to give your listeners a quick pause every 15 to 20 minutes during a talk for them to reset their attention span and get back on track with you. So the one minute paper. The one minute paper is a specific type of pause procedure. In this one, you basically pose a question or problem to your learners from the information you presented. Ask them to write down their response. This encourages them to commit to a response and engage with the material. Same as if you're on rounds and you want somebody to really commit to a differential or what they think the diagnosis is. An alternative commitment activity of this type includes audience response programs. This requires a little bit of extra work, but one good example is Poll Everywhere, which some of you may have seen used. This requires you to set up an account and have pre-prepared questions, but can be really helpful. Uh, particularly for the presenter, it can give you immediate feedback on how well your learners are understanding the material. But the most basic thing is just to have a pause with this one minute paper and have students write down kind of um, the answer to your question or concern for them. Let's talk about the muddiest point. This is a similar thing. Um, in the muddiest point, you encourage the students to pause for reflection on what was the most confusing thing for them about the information you just shared in the past 15, 20 minutes. This gives the chance to the learners to ask for further clarification on your teaching points. This not only helps your current learners, but may actually give you insight into what concepts could use further clarification in your presentation for future iterations. Our final strategy is think, pair, share. 
and think pair share you again pose a question to the group but give them a moment to individually reflect on your question then they pair up with a neighbor to compare responses and reach a consensus End this moment by calling on pairs to share their answer with the group this also can give you a sense of how well you're doing in presenting the information and again get them to commit to an answer so that's really all I have for you today. I have a couple of key resources that you might find interesting, particularly this paper from Wolf and colleagues, not another boring lecture from which most of this material comes. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and you can reach out to me on um, email or social media. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Katie, very much. And that was way less than uh, an hour. All right, so uh, today's lecture is part of uh, Andrew's uh, series on uh, diversity and inclusion. And to introduce today's speaker is uh, Jody Hawes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today. Uh, Dr. Sarah Cook and Jill Stewart are neuropsychologists in our general and community neurology division in our department. Dr. Cook, did her undergraduate work at the University of Pittsburgh before relocating in Florida and completing her master's degree in clinical psychology, her graduate work in gerontology, and her doctorate uh, in clinical psychology at the University of Florida in Gainesville. She completed her postdoctorate uh, fellowship at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in 2010, and then came and joined us uh, here at Duke later that year. She's a full-time clinician, seen many of our patients. She's helped me with so many patients uh, with wide-ranging conditions and provides expertise to the movement disorder division in the Huntington's Disease Clinic and with our uh, DBS program. Uh, some of her research has looked at cognitive training in folks with mild cognitive impairment and neuropsychological criteria to classify mild cognitive impairment. Dr. Cook recently took over the reins from Dr. Addix, now serving as medical director for their group. Dr. Stewart joined Duke in 2015 and came to us from North Carolina Neuropsychiatry, uh, where she worked as a neuropsychologist for four years. She completed her undergraduate work at the Light Blue School down the road in Chapel Hill, followed by graduate work at Loyola University in Chicago and her internship at the University of California in LA in clinical psychology. She worked as a research psychologist at Brentwood uh, Biomedical Research Institute in LA for a year before completing her fellowship back in Chicago again at Rush University. Her research interests include uh, psychosocial adjustment in the pediatric population with a special interest in youth with spinal bifida, as well as clinical and research interest in epilepsy and non-epileptic events. Uh, Dr. Stewart has provided a number of presentations to our residents and fellows on non-epileptic seizures and the management and uh, neuropsychology for epilepsy. Uh, Dr. Stewart works closely with the epilepsy division and serves as director of mental health in the Duke Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. And they are gonna uh, present today on uh, neuropsychology normative standards where we've been, where we're going, and why it matters. Um, please uh, help me welcome them. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Haas, for the introduction. So let me, um, there we go. Is everyone able to see my screen okay? Okay. So, uh, and uh, thank you to Dr. Spector as well for inviting the neuropsychology group to present at rounds today. Um, so uh, I'm Dr. Sarah Cook and I'm gonna be starting off the presentation. And then um, as Dr. Haas mentioned, uh, Dr. Stewart will be presenting the second part. And hopefully we'll have some uh, time at the end for some questions or discussion. So, um, we have no financial interest related to any of the content being presented today. However, we are both employed by Duke and the PDC. And in terms of what we're going to present today, I'm going to provide um, a brief uh, introduction 
about neuropsychological evaluations and some of the historical roots of normative standards in neuropsychology. And then Dr. Stewart will be taking over to discuss models of cultural competence and future directions for the field. And then we'll end with some case illustrations to highlight the need for taking this approach in clinical practice. So I'll venture to guess that the vast majority of clinical providers in our department have referred patients to our service for neuropsychological evaluation. Thus, you and your patients have been consumers of our work, so I don't want to belabor some of the basics. However, I briefly want um, to provide some foundational information for understanding what we do. So when your patients have complaints about cognitive symptoms, that might signal consideration of a referral uh, to neuropsychology. Now, there are at least six purposes for utilizing neuropsychological assessment. Um, probably one of the most common reasons we get referrals is to assist with differential diagnosis, where the presence or absence of deficit is explored to distinguish between various competing diagnoses. And the other uh, biggest source of referrals to our service is to inform surgical interventions or to predict functional ability. Now, we endeavor to add clinical value to your evaluation and management of your patients. And a, a recent meta-analysis backs up that neuropsychological evaluation adds incremental validity to other types of clinical information. So in one of the studies included in the meta-analysis, Gomar and colleagues found that conversion to dementia was best predicted by two cognitive variables and one imaging variable, although the cognitive ones accounted for more variance. And then in another study with the same cohort, they discovered that a particular delayed memory score was the earliest marker of disease progression before any of the biomarkers being collected in the project. Now, in addition to um, uh, having incremental validity, studies have also found that while neuropsychological evaluation, which is expensive itself, has led to healthcare cost savings, such as decreased hospitalizations and decreased healthcare utilization in the year following evaluation. So a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation is a lengthy process and includes integration of multiple sources of information. So accurate interpretation of examination behavior and uh, test responses requires knowledge of developmental and medical history, family background, educational and occupational accomplishments or failures, ability to manage daily affairs, and uh, level of social functioning, among other information. Now, this type of um, information is gathered during a neurobehavior examination and record review. And then the longest part is the standardized cognitive testing. And then it's after that where uh, scoring and the integration and interpretation takes place. So let's talk a bit about uh, the gathering of uh, test data. So a neuropsychologist chooses a set of tests uh, based on hypotheses generated from the referral question, the medical records, and the neurobehavior exam. Now, this testing elicits behavior samples in a standardized, replicable, and in more or less an artificial situation. Now, the approximate sameness of this test situation um, is uh, what enables the neuropsychologist to compare behavior samples between individuals or over time or with expected performance levels. Now, in order to make some sense of the pattern of performance on the various tests, the neuropsychologist must fully understand the nature of the tests administered, such as the input and output modalities, and what cognitive processes are required for successful completion. But you also have to have a thorough understanding of test attributes 
and analysis of why a patient might do poorly on one test, but not another measuring ostensibly similar cognitive processes or even very different ones in order to appropriately interpret the data. Now, history and observations will help the neuropsychologist evaluate the possible contributions of cultural differences or disadvantages, emotional factors, or developmental differences. Now, a number of other patient variables need to be considered in evaluating test performance, including things like sensory and motor status, the ability to understand and communicate in the evaluation, fatigue, as well as motivation and cooperation through this lengthy process. And these types of behavioral observations can provide very useful information about how a patient may function outside a formal structured evaluation setting. Now, once the test data have been reliably scored, the neuropsychologist needs to determine if performance on individual tests are impaired or not, and whether this pattern of performance is consistent with a known neurologic, psychiatric, or other medical disorder that makes sense with the history. Now, sometimes poor performance does not represent an acquired impairment, but rather can confirm a lifelong difficulty in this area. Now, when prior testing is not available for comparison, estimates of pre-morbid level of functioning become important for helping determine whether a particular performance represents impairment. So a change from this estimate, such as one one and a half or two standard deviations lower than the pre-morbid estimate may be useful for determining the likelihood that a particular test performance is impaired. Now, one single discrepant score or response can sometimes be disregarded just as chance deviation. It's really when there's a number of test score deviations in a given pattern where we're considered um, that there, it might reflect the presence of a brain disorder. Now, to make uh, comparisons necessary for evaluating impairment, the many test scores must be uh, compared and understanding how these test scores are distributed is necessary for this process. Now, some tests will be normally distributed and others will not. Now, shown here is the normal curve, which simply is a frequency distribution and it can provide an estimate of the normality or abnormality of any given test score, assuming that the scores are normally distributed. So how do we determine if the obtained score is actually a deviation from expected performance? Neuropsychologists use normative standards, uh, which are usually collected in the research and development of new tests. And Selecting the most appropriate normative comparison for each patient is one of the most important steps in the evaluation process. Now, there's two types of normative standards. So the first type is a large representative sample of the general population, usually at a given age or age band. And the second type of norm is demographically corrected such that the norm sample approximates as closely as possible to the unique subgroups to which the individual belongs with corrections not only for age, but for education, gender, and sometimes race. Now this type of normative standard is often preferable in clinical settings. Um, now because a test sensitivity, specificity, and impairment cutoffs depend on the norm selected, choosing norms necessitates a trade-off between the risk of making false negative errors and the risk of making false positive errors. So uh, when you pick, you're picking between the broadly representative versus demographically specific norms, um, it's gonna depend on the purpose of the testing. So at times it's gonna be paramount to compare the individual to all persons of the same age in the general population. So for example, in making a diagnosis of intellectual disability, 
um, or learning disability would be one such time uh, we would use that. But in many clinical situations, demographically corrected or utilized since results are used to address several types of questions, including diagnosis, uh, individual strengths and weaknesses, and then um, determining areas in need of potential treatment or accommodation. Now, here is an example of why we need to adjust for age. So uh, most cognitive abilities have specific developmental trajectories. Um, and these trajectories uh, depend on the times where there's the greatest growth, the extent to which cognitive functions change during adulthood, and their vulnerability to age-related decline. So a trajectory for a test of memory, for example, uh, differs markedly from a test of vocabulary. So the greatest slope in a vocabulary test occurs earlier in life where there's increase in ability, whereas the greatest slope in memory is during old age where decline is considered normal. Now, many normative data sets also include education and the corrections uh, such that those with higher levels of education are expected generally to perform better on some tasks than those with lower levels of education. Now, how did we get here to the norms um, that are used today? So the development of the first intelligence tests occurred in the early 1900s um, by psychologists Binet and Terman, and they did not have any demographic corrections. Um, but at the time, due to the vast social inequalities, such as segregated schools and healthcare facilities, as well as bias test items that were used, um, differences in test scores were found between various racial and ethnic groups, which perpetuated long held incorrect assumptions about racial differences in intelligence. And then over the years, this was used to do things like limit immigration and um, direct sterilization policies and segregation and other racist social and legal policies. And it wasn't until the civil rights era in the 1960s that there was greater concern raised uh, by many scientists and organizations about this type of racism within psychological science. Now, the subspecialty of neuropsychology is rather young. So the first sets of neuropsychology specific tests weren't developed until around the 1940s. And at that time, uh, the tests had a very different purpose than they do now, and were mostly used to assist with lesion location or lateralization. And at the time, demographic corrections were not utilized at all. Um, it wasn't for another few decades that the field began to collect data on large, more representative samples. So racial uh, categories are rooted in history and not biology. Um, so we know from the Human Genome Project that humans are over 99% similar at the DNA level. Thus, these uh, racial categories have been sustained by social norms and policies um, that have led to health inequalities. So, when neuropsychologists use race and demographic corrections, it's not to account for biological difference, but rather to serve as a proxy for social determinants of brain health, things like the psychological impact of racism, acculturative stress, literacy, quality of education, access to health care and nutrition, as well as the intersectionality of these and other variables that can influence brain health. So um, this is why we're here uh, speaking today because of stories in the media recently about the use of so-called race-based norms in the NFL settlement um, and a lawsuit that was filed by two black players alleging that the use of these norms were being misused to systematically make it more difficult for players to qualify for compensation. 
Um, but in fact, in clinical practice, you know, the use of demographically adjusted norms was developed to reduce harm to minoritized groups. Um, so when not adjusting for demographic factors due to the inequalities noted before, the result can be an overestimate of deficits and misattribution about neuropsychological dysfunction. And the cost of such false positive errors, such as a diagnosis of dementia when it doesn't exist, includes adverse psychological effects, possibly unnecessary medical treatment, uh, or negative financial repercussions if the person decides to retire earlier than planned based on the diagnosis. Now, on the other hand, false negatives can also be detrimental, such as not qualifying for a service or accommodation. So I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Dr. Stewart. I guess um, this would be considered a, uh, a pause procedure as um, uh, Dr. Moore uh, mentioned earlier. Okay, can everyone hear me? <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you so much for inviting us to come, Andrew and um, Sarah, for the introduction uh, and preface of what neuropsychology testing is about and where norms came from. I'm going to take over in talking about why we should consider race-based norms. Um, as Dr. Cook just mentioned, the accuracy of diagnosis improves when individuals are compared to their demographic counterparts. Investing in um, race-based norms also allows us to expand research on culture and cognitive test performance, and it allows for more buy-in from historically uh, marginalized groups or groups of minorities that have developed mistrust in the medical system and participating in research if we are invested in their sociocultural factors and factors that influence cognitive health and medical health as well. Um, there are some good examples of this already in the literature. Uh, we have uh, a large study that was done at Mayo, the Mayo Older African American Normative Study, or MONES, which is a large data set of norms for many of our commonly used or gold standard cognitive testing that specifically has demographic adjustments for older African Americans. Um, there's been a more recent project called the Numbers Project, which is a creation of norms, neuropsychological norms for folks that are Spanish speaking that live in the US Mexico border region. And then a battery, just as an example of, of tests that were developed and normed on native Spanish speakers that were educated outside the US, the Bateria Neuropsychologica in Espanol. And if you can tell, I took French <laughs> in high school and not Spanish, so I apologize for my terrible accent. But um, this is a really nice battery that utilizes a variety of tests of memory, attention, um, working memory, processing speed, problem solving much like we would do in our normal standard neuropsychological battery. Um, but there are education demographically corrective groups by education, and it includes uh, folks from Mexico and Central America who have much lower levels of education. Of course, there are disadvantages of race-based norms. So norms alone do not address the lack of cultural equivalence in cognitive or neuropsychological testing. Race and ethnicity are classifications or really not scientific constructs. 
the consideration of race alone really oversimplifies a person's experience. Um, and this is also personal to me, as most of some of you know, um, some of you don't, but I'm the proud mom to two uh, adopted at birth Pacific Islanders, true native Pacific Islander boys born in the US. And I think about the fact that there really is no demographic group that would encompass these Pacific Islanders, probably in general. And then you have, they were born in the US and they're being raised by two parents with PhDs. Um, so are in an arguably um, different set of background and experiences from other Pacific Islanders. So just having norms for Pacific Islanders really wouldn't take into account their experience. And this is true of a lot of groups, including um, African Americans, Hispanics, et cetera. There's a large variability in education, SES, and personal experiences of racism or um, oppression, discrimination. And those all impact one's background and to use race-based norms alone really oversimplifies their experience. Um, and I really just want to present this quote by Jennifer Manley, who's a neuropsychologist in Columbia. And she writes, by emphasizing the effects of cultural experience on neuropsychological test performance, we may reduce the importance of racial, racial classifications and raise awareness of the distinctiveness and depth of culture, which I think is really where we need to go. Um, in light of the attention that was brought not only to the issue with the NFL settlement, but also recent events like George Floyd, AACN has, which is the American Academy of Clinical Neuropsychology has put out a position paper. Um, I encourage you to look at it if you're interested, but the, the bottom line is that AACN supports the elimination of race as a variable and demographically based normative test interpretation. And in addition, AACN supports the development of testing methods and practices that reduce bias and inequity in clinical assessment and decision making. And um, I think that that again highlights the need that we are going to move as a field in terms of thinking beyond just race, but the process will be slow and iterative and will require some patience. There are already groups that have started working on this even before um, the AACN position paper and more attention has been called uh, in recent years. But even back in 2015, there was a task force, two task force that were created, one to re-envision multicultural guidelines, uh, which is an update to some guidelines that were put out by the APA in 2002 as well as a second task force that focused specifically on race and ethnicity. Um, and they're very detailed. They have a, a rationale behind their work, applications to practice research and consultation and case illustrations. So some of the fundamental guidelines, I think this applies to all of us, regardless of the fact that this came from an APA initiative is to strive and recognize and engage the influence of race and ethnicity in all aspects of professional activities as an ongoing process. Um, clinicians are encouraged to maintain updated knowledge of scholarship pertaining to race and ethnicity, including interdisciplinary and global perspectives. We should strive for awareness of our own positionality in relation to ethnicity and race and strive to address organizational and social inequities and injustices related to race and ethnicity and organizational structures within and outside of psychology. And you could insert neurology for yourselves as well. Um, there are additional lots and lots of guidelines about education and training. 
practice, research, I'm not going to read you all of them, but clearly we have a lot of things to aspire to. Which brings me to the point that guidelines are just that. They are aspirational tools. These are not rules, these are not governments, but these are things that we should aspire to. We must appreciate that a person can have and be shaped by multiple identities and contexts to which they belong. And each of these identities or contexts can have their own set of oppression and privilege or privilege. So in other words, race, gender, and class can intersect and they're not independent or static factors. Take for example, you're seeing a 53 year old US citizen who is a Burmese in immigrant. Um, she's coming in for evaluation of MS. She may have the privilege and safety and security of um, living as a person with MS in the US due to her legal status, but she could still experience discrimination and oppression in terms of employment opportunities, lack of access to resources as an immigrant, et cetera. So both privilege and um, oppression can be true in the same person. I think this is where, again, we're moving beyond just thinking about race to really more a framework of cultural competency, which is defined by Sue and colleagues as knowledge of a client's culture, worldview, expectations for treatment. There are self-awareness of personal values and biases that can influence the perception of the client or the patient and their problems and the dyadic relationship. And we also need to have skills to intervene in a culturally sensitive and relevant manner. Um, as far as for neuropsychology, Daryl Fuji has written extensively on this topic and he has come up with a really nice framework called the eclectic model. And the eclectic model is a, a framework that is designed to help neuropsychologists construct a cultural context with the goal of conducting an ethno-relative evaluation, or one that interprets cognition and behaviors over a culturally relevant denominator. Um, so here you can see what all of the, the letters stand for, but basically you need to consider education, the level, the quality, the literacy of the patient, the cultural and the level of acculturation. So how similar they are to Western society will give you some context. Their language, their native language, as well as their English proficiency, economic issues that they have encountered that would influence not only their cognition, but their background and level of education as well. Their communication style, or your communication style. So awareness of microaggression, racism, and ethnocentric behavior. The situation, and you can think about this was especially during the pandemic when we had limited visitors and we had female patients from cultures that potentially wouldn't have been alone with a male provider in a room, but unable to have a choice due to visitation restrictions from the pandemic. So all of these things we need to think about, as well as, you know, our notion of what intelligence means. So Western values of intelligence, for example, looks heavily emphasizes reasoning, problem solving, and speed. In America and Western cultures, we like everything to be efficient and fast. And that is just, that's one of our values. That doesn't necessarily translate to other cultural groups. Um, and, and then, of course, thinking about who immigrates and what is their access to resource and their experience and is that pool of people that were able to successfully make it here and um, immigrate to the US, does that represent their culture at large or does that signal some extra knowledge and resource that maybe isn't common in their country? There are several groups that have come together to actually put together standards. So these, unlike guidelines, are the, are the actual 
uh, standards. And so we need test takers to feel comfortable with the examiner in the situation. They need to be free of biases, which is very hard because if you think about it, cognitive testing is largely based on Western ideas of cognition and tests that were created in the West, even if they are translated and utilized in other countries. Um, tests should not, takers should not experience disadvantages in processing and responding to test items, and that we need valid interpretations for the intended use of a test, that we can assume that we are doing such in interpreting the test taker score. So I wanted to highlight um, some of my attempts to provide culturally competent evaluations in our couple of our Spanish-speaking pre-surgical epilepsy patients. Um, as Dr. Haas mentioned, I uh, do a lot of work with Duke epilepsy, and so these cases are drawn from my work over the last few years. But uh, the first case, Mr. C, he's a 22-year-old man who was born and raised in Mexico City. He's got eight years of formal education. When he moved to the US nine years ago, he was in middle school and he struggled to learn English. Um, so he was an English language learner and he was not doing well as such, which made his learning even more challenging and essentially functionally kept his education at eight years. Um, at the time of the evaluation, he was working full-time as an HVAC technician. He was clearly able to learn some trade-based skills and do well with that, despite limited formal education. He lives with his parents and two younger brothers, so he's got good family support. He's had seizures since he was eight years of age. Uh, he's right-handed. He's got a family history of seizures and um, had potentially some infantile seizures as well, possibly due to illness. I'm not gonna go over all the seizure types, but suffice it to say that he has seizures several times a week. In terms of his pre-surgical workup, his MRI, EEG, and video EEG seem to suggest the right right hippocampal uh, increased signal with mild atrophy and right temporal, right frontotemporal spikes or uh, seizures. For his neuropsychological assessment, I utilized measures that were developed and normed for native Spanish speakers that were educated outside the US, specifically actually in Mexico whenever possible. There were a couple of exceptions to what I was able to do there, including some nonverbal or perceptual reasoning items on the waist, trail making A and B, and the BVMT do not have um, norms for native Spanish speakers uh, that were educated outside the US, but I did utilize at least the education corrections whenever possible. All of the testing was also conducted by a native Spanish speaking psychometrician. So in terms of the results, his functioning was largely commensurate with expectation. His learning and memory was intact. And in fact, his verbal learning appears to be a relative strength as compared to other young Spanish speaking adults with similar education level. He, his performance across measures of perceptual reasoning, which is again, um, compared to other youth his age that were Western educated native English speakers, um, working memory, processing speed, and novel conceptualization and verbal fluency. Verbal fluency, of course, measured and compared to other Spanish speakers, uh, demographic matched peers are all average or better for his age and education. So I get, again, I think some of his experience and potential was impacted by the fact that he was unable to continue with his education due to trouble learning English when he moved to the US. But he was doing really well um, in Spanish when compared to his peers. So verbal reasoning skills are consistent with expectation. Um, Overall, his results are not surprising given that the seizures were 
suspected to arise from his non-dominant or non-language dominant right hemisphere. His strong verbal memory may mitigate some of his cognitive risk should he undergo resection. And visual memory is not necessarily strongly lateralizing. As it turns out, he did undergo resection. His last neurologic or neurology office note was about 10 months after surgery and he was doing well and um, no cognitive complaints. Well, from a seizure perspective, I think he had attained seizure freedom. Um, the second case I wanted to highlight shows additional complications when your patient is, has very limited or essentially is functionally illiterate and only has two years of education in their native country. So Mr. R, is, he completed two years of education in Honduras, which is, not which is not a cultural equivalent to second grade in the US. I just wanna be clear about that. Um, so we cannot make that assumption. He left school due to his seizures. He never learned to read or write in Spanish, uh, which is something that we would have assumed that second graders in the US could do, at least some. Um, and he does not speak or understand any English. His level of acculturation is poor. He moved to the US, oops, sorry, three years ago. He lives um, kind of very insulated. He works a factory job that his family got him and he lives with his adult siblings. They all live together in one apartment. Um, but he does have good family support and no other psychosocial risk factors. He has seizure frequency about four times a month. He's had seizures since early childhood. He does have a risk of falling and getting hurt with seizures. So that does heighten um, some concerns about safety. That's why he was being considered for surgery. His workup, again, he looked to be a right temporal focus. In terms of establishing a conceptual understanding for testing, I obviously needed to consider the fact that he has limited literacy in his native language. He cannot write. He doesn't know the alphabet, could not count to 25. He, we needed to, for visual memory testing, assume or ascertain the fact that he could even copy simple geometric shapes because if he couldn't do that and we presented him with that and asked him to do the task, we may be misinterpreting his scores as impaired when in fact he has no cultural or contextual understanding of the task we're asking him to do. Um, we often simplified the vocabulary, being mindful not only of acculturation, but his language and educational experience in terms of learning um, to make sure that he could understand the tasks that were being asked of him. So the, again, the testing was conducted in Spanish, this time with the aid of a medical interpreter using a very similar battery to the case I presented previously with the same caveats that there were a few measures that don't have a demographic normative comparison group. And he demonstrated intact performance across measures of working memory, verbal fluency, verbal learning and memory and visual memory for faces. This is extremely important because without having appropriately developed tests and um, normative groups, we wouldn't be able to appropriately assess things like verbal learning and memory or verbal fluency in a patient who's not a native English speaker with limited literacy and limited education. I mean, we needed to determine if what he is, what his performance is typical or not for someone with his background, because that helps us to determine functionally lateralization and localization of, of strengths and relative weaknesses or areas of dysfunction which allows us to appropriately lateralize and localize the fact that he did have deficits in his right hemisphere on measures of visual construction, perceptual reasoning, and visual learning and memory in comparison to intact verbal counterparts. Um, 
so for that reason, I felt that he would be at a lower risk of cognitive change. I can't really tell you the outcome yet as he just had surgery last week, I believe. So to be determined, but I am hoping for a good outcome for him. We have a lot of resources that are useful for all of us, not just neuropsychologists, but for neurologists as well. If you really want to get into understanding of one of your patients who is from a different country, from a, a real deep dive into their culture and linguistic factors, as well as what is normal in their educational system, there are some really interesting resources for that. So I just want to end with the fact that, again, although we started this topic thinking about race-based norms, the issues are so much bigger than that. It's not enough to develop tests and norms representative of diverse populations. We need to move really towards a cultural competency and being cognizant of our own biases, as well as the bias inherent in our tools of evaluation and how we use them. We remain complicit for 40 years uh, in one of the gold standard naming tests, the Boston naming test, presenting an item that was a picture of a noose and asking patients to name that and then trying to quickly apologize for having to show it to them. But, you know, instead of just, it wasn't until more recently that we actually did away with that item. So we remain complicit for quite a long time and we can't continue to do that. So we must swiftly identify, label, and address racism as it is encountered, not only in our treatment of patients and their experience, but as in how we evaluate them and how we interpret their performance before we make diagnostic decisions that would impact their life. The end. Yeah. <laughs> Go forth and be culturally competent and mindful and do good work. Thank you, uh, Jill and Sarah. And I know you know this, but no one ever makes a diagnosis just based on testing. Absolutely. It, yeah, if they do, they're making a terrible mistake. You're right. And so the testing is a part of the evaluation. It's not it's not the whole thing. And, and you know, the other interesting thing is in Alzheimer's research, there's evidence that if you study um, minority populations, you can find a huge percentage of people diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment who are then re-diagnosed as normal a year later. Yeah. Uh, probably because of the very things you've talked about. So. Every good evaluation starts with a good history. So Jill and Sarah, I just wanted to say thank you for that. That was a, a really good summary of the pros and cons. And um, you know, this, this started with something I wrote last year. So I'm sort of on record already as addressing my objections to, to race-based norms. But I think you did a good job of laying out both sides of that argument and why it can be problematic to use such a, a crude measure of race and sort of assume everybody fits. What I'm curious about um, at Duke, when we're when you're doing this real time, and you know, Jill, you gave good examples of how you're doing it for Spanish language, but <clears throat> do you ever choose based on whether or not you want to increase your risk of a false negative versus a false positive? I mean, the way we see the NFL doing it, it seemed that they were very specifically hoping for negative testing so they didn't have to compensate people and, and they sort of rigged it that way intentionally. But in the medical context where that's not on the line, do you ever say in this case, it's gonna be more important for us to qualify the patient for services or in this case, and, and sort of tailor your individual norms, what you're choosing to what that patient's story is and, and what your goals are? So, I just want to comment. I'm not entirely sure that they rigged it that way intentionally. I think they were using the norms as we would to make accurate clinical diagnoses, which had some unintentional effects. As and you and they, they had a sum of money to hand out. 
so they had like a billion dollars and they had to hand out the billions to somebody. So it right. wasn't that they were trying to save money. Right. I Yeah. Thank you for that. That's what I'm, that's a good summary of what I was trying to say. But, you know, I think that I also want to remind people that what people argue in a legal context is not the same thing as what people would argue or do in clinical practice. Lawyers like to argue all kinds of things as the <laughs> information and the data suits their opinion. That doesn't necessarily make it science and it doesn't necessarily uh, make it accurate in terms of clinical judgment and diagnosis. My job here is to provide my colleagues with accurate information and diagnosis. I mean, they're using my information to make surgical decisions and I would uh, so I so that's where my I guess error rate would lie in terms of how I approach testing. And I think regardless of whether you're using it for a pre-search evaluation or some other reason, we all are trying ethically to be as accurate as possible and also avoid the harm of mis of diagnosing someone with a condition they don't have and and uh, you know, and you can think of lots of examples for TBI and all the iatrogenic effects that we've caused in concussion and mild TBI. Uh, not we specifically, I would like to think we didn't do that, but, you know, in terms of neurology and neuropsychology elsewhere. And so being really mindful of accuracy, but of course there's tons of work still to be done and how to do that. And by no means are the race-based norms that we have now, they are not the gold standard, nor should they be. If anything, they probably are a better proxy for socioeconomic status than race itself. Well, and I think it also um, for those that don't know much about the norms, which is probably most people on the call, is that actually very few of the tests that we actually report on in our reports actually have race correction. So it's only a very limited number of tests that use race in the corrections, whereas other ones uh, do not. And it's just age and education based. You know, I, I've been working in Alzheimer's research centers for over 20 years, and I'd never even heard of race-based norming of tests. <laughs> And, and I guess that's where I come up with my argument that there was some rigging going on, because if you haven't heard of it in 20 years, why was that featured so prominently, you know, to the point that that they have evidence that it was systematically used. And yeah, I was very so, surprised. So that's, that's my concern there is, is you know, and, and we have Dr. Stewart saying that it's barely any tests where it's used. You're saying that it's not. And yet that was a feature in the, the so, way they did it. So, so there, there, are, there was a decision made to include that that didn't have to be made. Yeah, I think there are more available than what we use in our clinical practice. And I, I have done some of these NFL evaluations here at Duke. And so I know very, very firsthand what exactly is part of the battery and their very rigid criteria. And um, it, you know, not one of my more favorite things that I've participated in. <laughs> I'll just be honest yeah. about that. But, um, you know, I think that that some of them, they use more race corrected norms than what I actually use or what Dr. Cook or Dr. Ferrer use in real practice. So I think that's, it's not that there aren't some that are available, but I agree there is more bias. So we we are more selective in what we do clinically than what they had ascribed as part of the criteria, this rubric that they came out with, which was very strict. Um, yeah. Well, and they're now trying to correct some of this. So they are, um, yeah. they, the players are able to have their data re-scored using um, some a, a new standard that's been set. <laughs> Um, that does not take race into account, or I actually haven't seen it because we're out of the NFL program now, but we do still get the emails, but apparently there has been big change in how they're addressing it. And I'm glad you got the conversation going, Dr. Spector. Very useful. 
neuropsychology was never such an exciting topic. <laughs> right? Sarah, Jill, just one quick question. Sorry to barge in, Rich, but uh, has, has anybody gone back and, and reanalyzed data sets from the 80s or 90s before this was regularly done? I'm not aware of that. Um, we do update norms periodically because the Flynn effect and other reasons people get smarter and better at things over time as we evolve as a species. <laughs> So I can't say that people necessarily have gone back to do such work, but, you know, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. Great job, everybody. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Jill. And thank you, Katie, if you're still on. Everyone have a safe day.